So we're talking about technical analysis today and just the vast world of technical analysis. So hopefully it will at least be illuminating and could help with your trades. And so I try to make it a bit relatable and you'll see what I'm talking about right now. So, so let's talk about a stock market which is really vast and effectively what the stock market is, is just shares that are being bought or sold. It's nothing really, it, it's, it's, it's very complex, but it's, where, it's a institution where you could buy or sell your shares. And it actually plays quite a crucial, crucial role in modern economies by enabling money between an investor and a company. So for a newcomer, it could feel very daunting. Um, it's all these shares going up and down, all these financial instruments. And it could actually feel like you're in, I don't know if you've ever been to a trade fair. And you have all these people, these um, stall owners telling you what to buy. Um, discounts they can give you, you don't know if it's genuine or not, um, but it's pretty much that's how you feel when you're in a stock market. By just opening up your, your screen, you see all of these numbers flashing and all of that. So it could feel like a whole lot of people in a trade store trying to attract you to buy their product, right? And now with no proper strategy or plan, I know personally I've gone to a trade fair with exactly what I want and then I walk out with exactly what I didn't want plus what I want, right? And so there was no particular strategy. I just went there to go see what's going to happen and what to buy and end up over, you know, spending and so forth. So you can always walk out either with a lot of stuff that you didn't want or you could walk out feeling very, very fatigued and not wanting to go back. Now, to make proper decisions in the stock market, if you want to know what to buy or sell, and if you want to know what price to buy or sell, and when to buy or sell it, because there are two schools of thoughts, there's fundamental analysis and there's technical analysis. Now, if you want to know when to buy or to sell, how, when, that is when you use technical analysis. But if you want to find out how healthy the organs of a company are, um, where the company sees itself over time, as well as what the company is up to, any acquisitions, what is it, what it's going to do, that's when you use fundamental analysis. So as a trader or an investor, you would then either choose you want to use fundamental analysis or technical analysis to make your um, investment decisions, or you could use both. But there is a bit of a conflict of, you know, there could be a bit of a conflict with that. So you can, in the beginning, I usually say it's probably best to choose one, and then as time goes on, you'll be able to actually use both, which do at, at some point speak the same language. At the beginning of things, it could sound a bit conflicting. Um, reason being, uh, with technical analysis, it could give you entry signals a bit sooner than what fundamental analysts see. Um, so I'll give you an example, actually. It was when I used to do, on CNBC, it was known as technically fundamental. So they'd have a fundamental analyst and they would have me as a technical analyst and we'd talk about one share. I remember at that point it was actually Telcom. And um, I I mean, Telcom at the part was marred with, with bad rumors. No one would want to touch it. Technicals were saying, giving it a buy, right? And the, and the fundamental analyst was like, heaven's sake, he literally said, I would never touch that with my pinky. Needless to say, Telcom then, if I could show you the chart, maybe not now per se, but Telcom then actually went up. I think it was a, it gave a buy at 17 Rand, it went up to about 40. Now, I think he low-key bought it after I said it was a buy, but he couldn't really tell his other buddies, take fundamental analysts that listen, buy some, you know, technicals are saying buy, you can't do that, because we kind of have a clash sometimes, but I just like peace. I think we all gonna say the same thing. So you'd use fundamental analysis if you want to see how healthy the company is. And what it's doing, but in terms of, and that's why I say with, so with fundamental analysis, you're looking more at the intrinsic value of the company. With technical analysis, for lack of a better word, we couldn't care. We want the face value. When are you giving me the buy? What's the market saying? What's the sentiment saying about this particular share, right? News about it afterwards, okay. So when you enter that trade fair, to know exactly what you want, how to get it, and exactly, exactly when to go to the market is what you then is known as developing a trading strategy. Because you can't just get into the market and simply just buy, right? You have to have some kind of strategy or even sell at this point if you're trading CFD. So you need to have some kind of strategy in order to know where, where the share is going to go. Now, the stock market is quite simple. It's driven by supply and demand. If they supply, the shares will go down. If there's demand, the shares will go up, pretty simple. It's also driven by fear and greed. 
So if there's fear, the share price will, will fall. And if there's greed, the share prices will go up. And it's, it's pretty simple technical analysis because luckily for you, there are only three directions that you have to, there's no different directions that there's only three you have to remember is that there's an uptrend, there's a downtrend, and there's a sideways trend, simple. But the funny thing is, as simple as it is, it's mind boggling. It could be intimidating and very confusing. And that is why I've developed something that's known as a preparation kit for when you didn't get into the stock market because that preparation kit will then ha help you have an effective trading strategy. All right, so in my preparation kit, what I would then want is a map in order to know where to go. And I would want to have a compass to know the direction of where my buy or sell is going to be. So the map would act as drawing trend lines. Okay, because trend lines to me are completely invaluable. I'll tell you why. And then the compass, okay, because it, right. Map will then give you what the general direction of the trend is. Is it up, down, or sideways? Okay, that's what the trend lines do. And then the compass then identifies your support and resistance levels because you cannot enter on a whim because you just feel like it's going to go up. I mean, if that was the case, I think we'd all be doing this in a yacht somewhere on an island that one of you guys bought and you invited us. If you could just on a whim think of that, but you need to know or identify this, yes, support and resistance levels. So in this preparation kit, you have your map and your compass. Those are the two things that you need to know. Is it actually, is it a good time for me to buy? Because what your, your support and resistance level does with your compass is navigate your positions. Should you be long or short when you open up that chart, right? So. Your trading strategy, in having your map and compass, you need to understand and you need to draw trend lines correctly. Uh, listen, I've been in the market without giving off my age for 19 years and I'm still in my 20s. And I have professionals who still draw their trend lines wrong. And it irks me, I'm just like, just like move it forward. It's, it's, but to them it's like, oh, but this is just the area in which is, there's no area. You need to know when one trend is ending and the other is starting. So the trend line drawing tells you the end of one sentiment and the beginning of the other trend. So that's what you must keep in your mind. When, when a share price breaches a trend line, it's telling you the end of this sentiment and a potential start of another trend. Okay, so in other words, if it's in a, a bear trend, a share that's been falling, when a trend line is breached, that particular little point there tells you the end of downside and a potential start of new upside, okay? So can you see without that trend line, where will you, you know? And then effectively on the, on the upper end, it would then mean that particular breakout means the end of that upside and the beginning of downside. All right, so that's what your map is telling at this point. So you know exactly which direction you should then be participating in the market. Are you gonna be longing or shorting? And long means buying and shorting means selling. So now you have that idea with your map. Okay, so it's breached the trend line, what do I do? Okay, do, where do I buy and sell? And that's where identifying your support and resistance levels comes in. And this is your compass, which will navigate you to, okay, you should be buying actually, or you should be selling, all right? So that is what level to buy or sell. So in other words, when your resistance level is breached, it means you need to buy. And when your support level is breached, it means you need to sell. Okay, so your map and your compass is there to tell you, are you in the right direction with the market or you're trading against it? And if you are in the right direction, at what point must you be buying? And if you're in the share already, at what point must you be selling? Okay, so resistance levels themselves, they connect highs. Now, if you've seen, which I'll, just, I'll show you actually when we're talking about the candlesticks and the bar charts, they connect the highs. And what the highs are is the highest price that buyers are willing to trade that instrument, like the highest price. So if it keeps, if this hypothetically just say 10 Rand, if it keeps hitting 10 Rand, that means that's the most they want to pay for that share, 10 Rand, okay? But it's not the case all the time. When that resistance level gets breached, it means they could actually pay higher for that. All right, so, Resistance connects the highs, and it's the highest price that buyers are willing to, to pay. Support connects the lows. And that is then the lowest price that 
um, sellers are willing to trade the instrument. So if you see it bouncing on support, it's because sellers are like, I'm not willing to sell this to you for more than, for, for less than two rand, for example. And then sometimes they give in and that's when the capitulation of the share happens. So when your resistance level is breached, it's when we then aware that, oh, so buyers have the, they can actually move the share price higher, which is the reason why you then see the share price going higher and higher. But when support is breached, it means sellers are willing to sell this at a lower price than where it is, and that's what causes the capitulation. So you've got your map and your compass to guide you already, all right, when it comes to, when you're looking at your chart. Now, when I talked about the highs and the lows, I just want to touch on where you would then identify those highs and lows. By giving you an example, uh, well, showing you what candles are versus to bar charts. Now, these are bar charts, and they look, they, they're simple as this. Oopsie, what have I done now? Oh, oops, 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 oops. Sorry. There we go. So this is the bar chart. Okay, okay. This is a bar chart. And in the bar chart, you would then have your open, which is always going to be on your left side, all right? That little um, notch there, those are, would be your open. And on your right side would always be your close. Okay, so in other words, if your open is higher than your close, it then, oopsie, sorry, I'm just getting used to this whole button pressing thing. Um, before I get to that point, you remember the highs I was telling you about and the lows? So this is where you would identify where your highs are of a bar chart. And this is where you'd identify where your lows are at in a bar chart. Okay. Now, if your open is higher than your close, it then clearly means that it's a bullish candle. There are more buyers than sellers. And then if your open is lower than your close, it then means it's a bearish candle, that it might have opened higher, but sellers then took charge and pushed the price down, further down. So you've got your highs right there, you've got your lows, and depending on where your open and close is, you'll then be able to determine whether it's a bearish or a bullish day. Now, when it comes to candles, they have a better visual representation of what's happening. So with candles, you would still, sorry, um, those little wicks there are what gives you your highs and your lows. So that would be effectively where your resistance, oof, where your resistance would be and where your support would be. But without having to look at where did it close, where did it, it's, you could just tell from a white candle that that is a bullish day. And your open would obviously be right there. And your close would be at the top there. And then when it comes to a black candle, it just kind of tells you that it was a bearish day. Okay. So your open would have been, in that case, your open would have been up there and your close would be there, right there. But because you don't have to really determine where was the open or was the close, the candle tells you that a white candle or a green is a bullish day, a black candle or a full candle is a bearish day. So as you may see, the difference between the two, they, they have the same function, but just visually different for you to understand. But when I have to use um, candles versus bar charts, I'd use bar charts mainly for a longer term period because I like keeping my charts quite clean. So as you can see, the bar chart on a longer time frame and I'm looking at the weekly, it then, it's, it, as you can see, it's, it's clean and that's when I could then start making my analysis as, should I be buying, should I be holding, should I even get into this? Or if I wanna get into it, at what price? Because that's where people get wrong. Um, they get in not knowing at what, phase this trend or what the trend is doing because they heard their friends or they read something that um oh the, the results of this company were stellar and then they're like just buy now you don't know if you're buying right at the top you're buying in the middle or you're buying at the bottom okay so this is what the chart helps you with to say despite what the results are saying is this really is the market feeling as bullish as the results because sometimes, you remember when I said there could be conflict with technical analysis and fundamental analysis? Because there have been many instances at times where results of a company do really well. I just wanted to mention Steinoff, but it might be a bit of a sore point for people. But with technical analysis, you could have determined exactly when to sell before that entire collapse. 
And that time those results were looking good. You were just calling your broker, buy me more. And then buy me more, not knowing where it was in its trend, if it's reached the extreme, would have been the one that did an RIP. You would have been just a little, and, I, and I've, I've got it wrong in the market. It's not nice when you get it wrong. You just, your mood changes. You don't want to speak to no one. Yeah, I trade daily and it happens. So on a longer time frame, it's best to keep your chart clean by using the bar charts. Because remember, they do the same function, but it's just the visual representation of it. Now, in this case, seeing this clean chart, this is when I'm now going to use my map and my compass. So my map will then tell me, ooh, okay, ooh, delicious, right? Trend line, oh, I forgot to put the dates here, but trend line has been breached. It does look, it's a weekly chart, so this is probably a trend line that's dated quite far back. It's breached. Oh, it looks like buyers are starting to like this from years of downside. It looks like sentiment is changing. Remember, this particular point marks the end of this and a potential start of that. All right, so your map is giving you that. Then it tells you that, but then what point do I buy? Okay, should I buy now? And in some cases, you don't really buy immediately when your trend line is breached because you don't know if it's a false break and reversal, right? So then you need to establish what, oh, sorry, yes, question. Oh, I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, how accurately do you draw that trend line? Is it like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. You actually, you plotted on, so that's where the highs and the lows work. See now on a, on, oh, is there something? Oh, okay. I thought I pressed something. So if you use a line chart, you won't be able to tell this as much, but that's why I implore you to rather use bar charts or candlestick charts. So what you need to do is connect it. It's pretty much connecting the dots. So when you draw a trend line, you, it's 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 actually simple, but some people actually draw it wrong. So you would you have to play around, and the more times that it connects to those falling tops in this instance, because it is a bear trend, the more significant that trend line becomes. And even more so is if it's dated way back, then you must know it's a big deal. Okay, it's it's like a, okay now guys, let's let's get those monies ready. So. Some people actually draw it in between. And I, I really don't understand why, because what if it gives false signals? You may just hit in when it's still in its bear trend. So it's important to actually connect those, those, those falling tops in a downward trend and those rising bottoms in an upward trend. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a... Yeah, but I will, I will try. Yeah, I, I could show you afterwards. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so my map is telling me that something juicy is happening here. Um, sellers are becoming outnumbered, and it seems as if investors are warming up to this share. Now I need to find what price would I buy, and that's when I use my compass. Compass will then identify where my highs and my lows are. So I would know that, oh, okay. So at this, oh, sorry, at this particular point, I could get in at that point. So every time your resistance levels gets breached, it becomes a buying opportunity. But if, for example, it could do this, trade there and then reverse and go through support, that itself tells you that it's a good thing I didn't get in. Because if I did, because this could have been a fast break, reverse, and then back into that support and back into, because the market could do that. So it's important to identify those support and resistance levels so you know when to get in and when not to get in. And even if you are in, when should you be getting out? Okay. I don't mean to drag fundamental analysts, but they don't know this. It doesn't tell you this. No, they just, you know, I love the way they do it. Like, give you broad, you know, um, I remember they would be like, oh, you know, you're just above 40 something you should buy. You're like, okay, that could be, I could buy it at 80. Like what's, technical analysis will say at 13, 40, there, 1350, if you have to run it off, is the price you should be buying. Because if it breaches that level, it means buyers are going to now push it up to the next level and potentially next level. So you're buying every time it breaches where it has hit a ceiling. So if it hits a ceiling, breaches that ceiling, it then goes up. 
So every time it reaches a ceiling, it means the momentum is upward. Okay, so my map and my compass, I have those in place. I know when I'm going to be buying and when I should not be buying if it reverses. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, this in between this one. Okay, so really great question there. So this particular one, can you see what it's connecting? Those lows. Can you see these lows? Now you have, you always have to see where it's hit a floor. So just picture picture resistance being a ceiling, support being a floor, and a ball bouncing. Every time it hits support, it bounces. Every time it hits resistance, it falls. But sometimes it will breach that resistance and sometimes it will breach the support. So the more times a level is tested like this, it becomes a, 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 an important support level. So this has also been tested twice. If it's tested more than twice, it's, it's a key level. Sure. There are others, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about the time frame right now. If you are a long-term investor, it's best to look on a on a monthly or a weekly um, a chart to get your to to get your um, your prices. I'll show you in the next. You'll see it as we progress the t the different time frames. Thanks for that. Okay, so this is a bar chart for a longer time frame. Now, if you want to use a shorter time frame, it's better to use a candlestick chart because you have a better visual representation of which are the up days and which are the down days because remember you're trading you're not a, you're not a, an investor in this case you're trading movements okay so you need to know you know what would be what would what how is it looking for that day or how did it look previously and you can almost tell in this case that these were up days these were down days you don't, you don't have to kind of see where did it close, where did it open, what's bullish, what's bearish, like a bar chart. Because bar chart, longer time frame, you need a broader perspective. With a daily, with a daily um, uh, shorter time frame, you actually need to see what, which are the down days and the, which are the, the, the up days. All right. So let's see, do I actually put there the map? So my map there at this point in time is where I would have bought, right? It broke out of that trend line and is starting a new bull trend. So at this point, it marked the end of this bearishness and the start of upside. Okay. And then we go to our compass that would then give us our, our support and resistance. And again, you're probably asking, why is this here? Because at some point, this was resistance and resistance becomes support. So what was once the ceiling becomes support. Okay, so in other words, if you're trading this and it's breached this level, as it goes up, this support will be the level in which you want to get out should, should, should it turn downwards. So you now you know the levels. I think that is so invaluable, knowing the levels. Instead of trading blindly, you know exactly at what price you should be getting in and exactly what price you should be getting out. Okay, so my map and my compass has told me this, and it's information that guides me as to for example, um, okay, and then now, you know, this is this 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 was previously resistance becoming support. Um, the red ones would then mark what was previously resistance becoming support, but they read because it gives me the danger sign that okay, this is when you're supposed to be getting out. Okay, so as I said, the beginning of this this would have given me the buying signal. Now, if you bought and this is where it's trading, so I think it's less. I'm not too sure. It's just below 11.50. Would have made a nice profit with this trade knowing at what price to get in. And the continuation of this trend line would have said, stay in, stay in, stay in. Until such time as, and this itself, you draw a trend line over here. I const, I'm constantly drawing trend lines, guys, because the breakout of this trend line would have then said, oh, okay, this is probably gonna fall. And when it falls, it will go there and probably there. So it gives you direction as to how far it could fall or how far it will rise. Okay, so that's the map and compass for that. So this, I was basically emphasizing the bar charts and the candlestick charts there. All right. So the candlestick charts have a better representation of trading activity. And they are created explicitly for daily pattern recognition because day 
traders, swing traders, your um, scalp traders need a visual representation of what's going to happen because they're trading constantly. Okay. Then the bar charts are more simple lines, and they do have they have a little more trend accuracy accuracy because they're less busy than the daily charts. All right. So that comes the, this comes to the end of the bar. I just wanted to kind of emphasize the difference between a bar chart and a candlestick chart. Now let's come to stop losses. Okay. So now we we've got our map that tells us when if if we're in the right direction, our compass that tells us when where is where is the kill? Okay, not the kill. Um where's the hunt? I don't know. Where's the food going to be at? And you just follow that. Is it on the north to south? Where's my buying level, right? Now, when you enter the position, you need to protect yourself for a sudden move. Okay, because as much as technical analysis works really well, you also have to com you could get wrong with what your analysis is. And it's not just that. There could be news the company has that completely, you know, throws off the trend. Um, and now you need to quickly scrabble and get out. But if a particular stop loss or level has been breached, you know how much actually you're going to lose from the trade, right? You're not going to be, for example, um, Steinhoff, you would have, that turn in the trend, it would have told you at this price, you need to completely get out because there's potentially going to be potential downside. Now, I didn't know that the downside was going to be that vast, but one was able to get out of that trade or that investment, because it was already saying, I'm not, the, the end, this, this upside is starting to end, and we're probably going to now get into downside, because shares don't go up indefinitely, neither do they go down indefinitely. Okay, so stop losses. Now, preparation kits, we're going back to the preparation kit. We've got your map that, that helps with the drawing trend line, you've got your compass, that identifies support and resistance, now you need your binoculars, right? And your binoculars will help you spot what the step loss levels are because what the binoculars do is prevent any, you're going to look at where there's the danger, okay? So where do you, so you, you where will I spot, at what point do I now run because there's something headed towards me, okay? Now with stop losses, the binoculars, in this case, protect your investment. Because if you're sitting with all of this money, who's going to try and rob you? You're going to have to see them from far so that you can either pull out your little stunt gun or your pepper spray or whatever to stop them on their feet because you can tell from far where the danger is coming, um, coming from. So you're protecting your stop losses and you're limiting, you're either limiting your loss or you're locking in the profits that you already have with a stop loss. It helps you to actually just manage your risk on a trade. Without your stop loss, you're, you're, you're again trading blindly. And it's a bit scary because you need to put something that will say, if this, is, if this goes wrong, where do I get out? Okay. Now, stop losses, I'm just going to mention there's, there's a few of them, but I'm going to mention three key ones that I particularly love in terms of the, the functionalities of them. There's a simple percentage stop loss, then there's a 2% rule, which I really love, and then there's a 1 to 3 golden ratio stop. Okay, so let's start off with a simple, let me just show you what a stop loss is and how the, the functions of a stop loss. So for example, let's say you've bought a share, and if you've bought the share, your stop loss will be below your entry price. Okay, so if this is where you're getting in, if things go wrong, this is where you should go out. So if it doesn't actually go up and turns and you're already in the share and it goes down, this is where you should get out. And then in, an, in a selling position, um, it would actually be above the entry price and not below. Okay. So um, if, it, you, you, if you've sold and it actually starts going up, it needs to stop you out at some point because it's not going in the direction you want. So that would then be above your entry price. Now, if we talk about a simple stop loss, there are three types of simple stop losses. There's a percentage stop loss, there's a trailing stop, and there is a chart stop. All right. 
Now, your percentage stop is just a percentage stop. It's whatever you 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 whatever risk that you are willing to take with that with that trade. Um, for scalp traders or CFD traders, they would prefer like a one percent because remember they in and out of trades. Um, they're looking to make a three percent and not be a long-term investor who's looking to make. 20% in the investment. So they have to keep their stop losses tight. If you are a swing trader, which I, I mean, I do dabble into scalp trading, but it's a bit stressful. So I'm more on a swing trader. And that's when you'd keep it to a roughly three to 4% stop loss. Um, if you see the share itself going up by, let's say 8% or so, you'd keep it around there. And if you are a more of a long-term investor, the suggested stop loss is anything between 10 to 15%. Because remember, you're leaving it to, or else you're going to be stopped out all the time. And what's the fun of that? You know. So this, these are the suggested stops for a percentage stop loss would be one for a scalp trader, three to four for um, swing traders, and 10 to 15. Because effectively, a bull trend only becomes a bull trend if it's gone up by 20%. And a bear trend only becomes a bear trend if it's fallen by 20%. Okay, anything in between could be just a correction. Okay, so for example, if it's a, if you're using a simple percentage stop loss for 100 rand, if it's a 3%, it means um, you want to be 3% of 100 rand is 3 rand, so your stop loss would be at 97 rand. You get in at 100 and you want to be stopped out at 97 if things go the opposite direction. And if it is, so it means at 97 you'll be stopped out, and a 15% um, stop loss would mean you'd be stopped out at 85. You get in at one rand and you want to be stopped out at 85, so meaning 85 is what your stop loss level will be. Those are percentage based, very simple. Then there is a trailing stop loss. Okay, so trailing stop loss automatically adjusts, the, so you would have to have a percentage at first. So if you decide I want a 1% trailing stop it will trail as it goes with as your share price goes up it will go up with your um, with your with with the share for example let's say your buying price was at 9 rand 50 and then a 5% stop loss means your stop loss would be at 9 rand 02 the share price goes up and goes to 11 your your trailing stop loss will follow and and it will now not be 902 but now 1045 if it continues with this uptrend and goes to 12 rand, um, your stop loss will now become 11 rand 50. So it trails as it goes up. But the minute the share price starts falling, your stop then stops. Okay? And if it falls, let's say to 11, you would then be stopped out at 11.50 instead of. So it stops when there is an anomaly. If it's not trading and drop and then it starts doing funny things, you'll be like, oh, okay, time for me to stop now. So it effectively looks something like this. It will trail the price, and if there's any anomalies in the share price, it will then stop so that it could stop you out. So initially, when you start your trade, you start off with a percentage stop, which is standard, and if it then goes in that direction, you can then change it to a trailing stop loss. Okay, but you have to have a particular percentage in which you want it to, to stop you out or to follow. So that's a simple one, and it's always useful, particularly if you cannot be watching your trades all the time, um, you work or whatever, um, or you're on holiday, once you have your trading stop loss, you can relax. And that's a mistake that many people then do is that they set a stop loss, the share price goes up, they don't change their stop losses, and then the share price goes down, and then they look at it like, oh man, I had made this amount, and then it put, and now I've lost money. That's not the market's fault. That's a you fault, not the market fault. Okay. So this is a stop, trailing stop loss. Then you have a chart stop loss, which is actually the one of the most popularly used one than a trailing stop loss. Um, and this one is based on your, your compass, your support and resistance levels. It's the support levels particularly. So, um, it will, so it, it's based on support resistance and any other trend lines. Um, so it is popularly used. I use, once I'm in the trade, I use a lot of, support levels as my stop loss rather than a percentage because the thing about that is sometimes um, your percentage stop loss can stop you out before it has hit a particular support and then it hits support and then goes up again and you're like oh man you know 
And you know that, I don't know about you, but you know that the initial part of when a trade goes through, I tell you, my heart just flatters because it's that part where you're like, is it going to go there? No, yes, you know, but when it goes in the direction, you're like, yes, okay, it's in my direction. Okay, so it's chart stop losses for me are better in a sense that I know that once that support is breached, it means sellers are coming in. So just picture that. If resistance is breached, it means more buyers are willing to come into the market. If support is breached, it means more sellers are willing to come into the market. Okay. Um, so this is basically how your support would be. So can you see that's a support level? So in other words, it went up, but can you see it's starting to jitter? So if it turned, this is where I'd be stopped out. Because it is a, a level that it was holding on for some time. And sellers were like, nope, this is the price. This is the price. And then when it breaches it, then you're like, okay, well, they're willing to sell it at a lower price. And that's when you then start seeing other support levels. So support stops work very well in a sense of telling you where the general or ubiquitous traders are feeling that there is a floor. And if that floor is breached, it means it could go lower and lower. So that's why they become more popular in a sense. Okay, so these are your chart stop losses. Um, which is different from what your trailing is and what your percentage is, your percentage stop loss. Okay, so these are the simple stop losses. Then comes the one to three golden stop loss, um, which is which basically means for every three rand profit, for example, for every three rand profit on a trade that you make, you only want to risk one rand. Okay, so for example, um, Let's say you want to buy at 13.25, and once it breaches this particular uh, level, then you know the next level it may go to is that next resistance level. So you then say, okay, so I will then take my profit at 16.10. So I'm buying it at 13.25, and I'll take my profit at 16.10 when it reaches that. So then your percentage return from 13.25 to 16.10 is 18%. So what you would do would go 18 divided by 3. That means your stop loss should be 6%. So it depends on where your take profit is and you just divide it. Instead of having, if you're not too sure what your percentage stop loss would be, most people just use a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. But you need to know at what price and where you see it going. So you can determine that. Okay. So this is quite a simple one. So your stop loss would be 6% in this case. So to make, to make an 18% profit, you're willing to lose 6% of the trade okay then comes the two percent this one i love this is like a all rounded insurance policy this one two percent it's a it's not complicated at all but it's going to blow your mind are you ready okay so two percent rule means you're not risking more than two percent of your capital amount on a single trade so this protects your capital that you've invested as well as the trade that you're in. The ones I've been telling you now, your simple stop loss and your three to one ratio only protects your trade. The 2% protects your capital and your trade. And you might be thinking how, okay, let me tell you. So the main advantage is that you'll be able to take on more trades at any particular point in time, okay? So what 2% does is protect your capital amount and it protects your position. So it's capital risk, which protects your capital amount and your position risk, which protects your trade position. It even tells you how many shares, this calculation tells you how many shares to buy to only risk 2% of your capital. Only 2%, so that's why it's called the 2% rule, all right? So hypothetically, let's say you've got a 5,000 Rand account. Your investment, you're starting your investment initially with 5,000 Rand. Now, 2% says you only want to risk 2% of your capital that you've invested, which means you're going to only risk 100 Rand per trade. I know it sounds crazy, right? You'll see. It sounds really crazy. When I started doing this calculation, I was like, what the? So you're only going to, and how do you get to this 100 Rand? So you'll go, 5,000 times 2% equals 100 Rand per trade, okay? Now, when you want to, so now you're protecting your capital. You only want to lose 2% of your capital should the trade go wrong. Now you want to see what, what is, you want to also protect your trade. 
and that's where the position risk comes and that's when you use your simple stop loss so so for say for example you want to just lose your stop loss is 10 percent so for example let's say you want to buy growth point at 13.25 that is a real level just by the way that's where you could buy if growth point is trading above 13.25 it's a buy just some of these i kind of give you a sneaky recommendation <laughs> little only just for us situation so um so you want to buy at 13.25 and what would your stop loss be if you're buying at 13.25 remember we agreed on a 10 percent stop loss so 13 times 10 percent which is 0 0.1 that means for every um, for every share, you just want to lose one rand 32 from that, which then means your stop loss would be at 11.92. So 13 minus 1, 10% of that would 132 is equal to 11.92. All right. That is at 11.92 is where you're going to be stopped out. You're going to buy the share at 13.25. If it goes wrong, you want to be stopped out at 11.92. Okay, that's what your simple stop loss, and that's how you you are protecting your trade. Now, you're buying at the at thirteen twenty five. You want to be stopped out at eleven ninety two. Now, your account balance is five thousand. Risk tolerance is two percent, two percent rule. You want to risk a hundred a hundred rand per trade to protect your. I mean, hundred rand yeah per trade to protect your your trade, you've got a 10% stop loss, and the price of the share is at 13.25. So how many shares must you buy in, or, in order to only risk 2% at a 10% stop loss? You need to know that, right? So this is how it works. You kind of have to work kind of backwards. So your 2% rule is 100, and your risk per share is 100, I mean, 1 rand 32, which means you'd have to buy 75 shares growth point to only risk 2% of your capital. Okay, so how did I work out the 75 shares? It's 100 divided by 1 rand 32 equals 75 shares. Fine. So the 2% rule says 5,000 minus that times 2% is 100 and your stop loss says 75 shares times 1 rand 32. Can you see that you're only risking 100? It's actually below 100 rand. Okay, so now your portfolio you got your portfolio, you're excited, it's 5,000 Rand, your first share is growth, um, growth point and you're buying 75 shares of growth point to risk only 10% of your, of, of your trade, to, sorry, to risk 2% of your capital with a 10% stop loss. So your total cost would be 75 times the 13, 25, which means your total cost of that trade will be 900, and 93.75. So now you've got 5,000 minus that, you have 4,000 roughly to still invest. So you've got 75 shares sitting in your portfolio and you're all proud of them. And now you're like, okay, I've got another 4,000 to spend. What can I buy? Let me use my map and my, all right. So let's buy another share. Let's go for a more expensive share. Tips. Aspen. Right, so Aspen, you've used your map and you've used your compass and your map and your compass, you're, you've broken out of a particular trend and your um, compass says at that price is when you should be getting in. Okay, so you're only risking 10%, right? So it's 250, uh, 253 times 10, it means it's 25 Rand 30, fine. So it means that 227.70 is what your stop loss is where you'll be stopped out, which is 253 minus that is equal to that. All right. Now you buy at that price, that's your stop loss. Now you already know what your risk is, how much you're going to be losing. How cool is that? So there's no, oh, when did that happen? You know exactly when to get out, right? So account balance. 2% to only risk 2% of your capital at a 10% stop loss, how many shares must you buy? You work backwards again. So 100 divided by 25 rand 30, which means you have to buy 3.9 shares. I mean, you can round it off unless you can buy 3.9. I doubt it though. But if you have to, so how I work that out is 100 times uh, divided by 225, which is, let's say, rounded off to four shares. 
all right? So 2% rule says you only risk 100 bucks, and three shares, if you buy three of Aspen shares, you only, can you just see, you're only losing 75 Rand, which is still below 100. If you buy three Aspen shares, and if you buy four Aspen shares, because it's 3.9, right? So you decide you want to push it a little, you will lose slightly, slightly more, one rand something more, but it is still in that 100 rand bracket. All right, so what you do in your portfolio is now you've got, if you buy three Aspen shares, you're literally going to be using 1,004. 14 of your portfolio amount so now your portfolio so it's three shares times 253 equals to that now your portfolio you've got 5,000 minus your growth point minus you've still got 2,900 odd to use to buy another share all right so from this you can roughly see that with a 5,000, and this, this percentage changes because, it you know, the, the amount changes according to what your, your stop loss is and what your capital is, all right? So your portfolio at this point, you can then see that roughly it means you're literally using 1,000 Rand to buy shares, which then means you can buy five shares in your portfolio, which then means if you can only buy five shares and they all had to lose, you'd only be losing 500 Rand. Do you, do, you, do you get that? So you'd only be losing 500 Rand. You've got five shares, one really reasonable one, one quite expensive one, and you still have to, you can still buy three more shares. And if they all had to be wrong, like if you, were, if you did your analysis wrong and you lost all five, you'd only lose 500. So now you're sitting with 1,000, sorry, no, my math is wrong, 4,500 if all of them were wrong. I mean, I hope they, you don't get to that point. But if, if you're only losing 500 Rand, which means it's five shares times 100, that means you could make 50 wrong trades for you to completely blow your capital. 50. If you start losing 50 wrong trades, it's okay. You, we, can, we can talk. We can see where I can see where I can kind of figure out where you're going wrong. Because at 50, then you must know you need to take a trader's vacation. And just husa, call on those trading guards to give you more knowledge to get back another 5,000 and repeat the cycle. Okay, but 50 wrong trades. With 5,000, like it is, it, it's, and you're just losing by just working it backwards. I've got a whole Excel spreadsheet if you want me to sh um, share it with you where you just put your capital amount and, your, and it just tells you what it is, right? Um, I'll speak to Sai. <laughs> okay, so this is my favorite one because it protects both your capital as well as your position, the 2% rule. All right. Whew, we're done with stop losses. Okay, I just, I'm just kind of, tell me if I'm talking too fast though, guys. All right. Um, now we're going to look at the different charting periods. Because now we've got your map, your compass, and you've got your binoculars. You're set. Okay, you know exactly where you're going, how to shush out that danger. You're on the right track, and you even, you're even protecting your capital and your position risk. You're good. But now there are different charting periods because we all trade differently in terms of time frames. Okay, so have you ever heard of the, say, you, the trends your friend? It's a, it's, a, it's a popular saying that when they say that it's because if you're not if you're going against the trend, it's your own fault because follow where the market's going. Don't try to be clever and say, I just want to outsmart it. It will outsmart you. I've tried it, and it, it brings you back to center. So the trend's your friend, and if you want to see what the trend is, you need to date back your charts. Okay, so it means you have to establish where the primary trend is. And the only time you can establish what the primary trend is, is by looking at your monthly or your weekly chart. Because when you open up your chart at first, it defaults to a daily chart. All right. And I don't know, I, I just, it, 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 I get anxiety if I just have to look at a daily chart. I need to know what is the lifespan of the chart. Am I trading with the trend? 
or am I trading against it? Because they will look vastly different. A daily chart and a monthly chart looks different. Okay. So you need to first establish the direction of the trend in order to know which direction you should be trading. Now, markets exist in several time frames simultaneously, depending on what type of trader you are. So if you're a long-term or a position investor, you would then look at a monthly or a weekly chart. If you're a swing trader, you would then look at a daily chart. If you are a day trader, you would look at an hourly chart. And if you are a scalp trader, you would look at anything from a 30-minute to a 5-minute chart. And believe you me, I've traded a 1-minute chart. 1 minute could feel like a year when you're trading and you're in the wrong side of the position. I've never, you know when you try and you try and shift the, the trend yourself because in a minute it's 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 crazy what what these these things could do to you but this is the time frame but in order to establish the primary trend you need to first start off by looking at what the monthly weekly chart is so you're not trading against the trend on your daily hourly or your 30 minute chart or your 30 minute charts okay now let me show you an example of that so we're going to look at truets and uh, towards at this point in time we're going to look at August being the recent month and this is this this is this these are the candles for August on a weekly chart we've, we're three months into uh, three weeks into August so this is one week candle second week candle this is the current candle okay so this is how it looks on a weekly chart if you look on a daily okay then you would have known oh yes before I get into that now as an as an investor it would have told you to buy at that particular point in time remember it's breached the trend line and where does where's your um, your compass saying it says at this point at 9320 you should be buying because it's it's likely to go up okay so that's that's a long-term investor so you're thinking okay that's the price I will buy now if you look on the daily chart can you see those three candles Look, this, and this is the time frame right there. They, that's the beginning of August. So it's the same trend line, but diff it's different amount, like the amount of candles that are there are no longer three, but more. Now on the daily chart, because if you're using a daily chart, you want to get an earlier entry into a, a trade and not a later entry. So what would happen there? So this is this is the month of August and can you see where the resistance level is there? It told you to buy at 91.70. And then it goes up, it would have said, and you could reload and buy more at 93.25. The weekly said strictly buy at 93.25 if you're a long-term investor. But the daily was able to establish resistance levels that are not visible on the weekly chart. So you're able to get in a bit sooner. So long-term investor i mean it looks like a, a small amount but sometimes when it is a vast amount because when you then look at a shorter time period you'll get an earlier entry price because it's established support and resistance on that time frame so with a daily you would have gotten in there and you would have reloaded there so your profits would be looking more than a weekly investor but remember a weekly invest i mean not a weekly investor a long-term investor is there for the long run you there for just a few days of the trade so reloading helps you to make those profits because once it starts turning you're going to get out okay now this is a daily chart now look at it on an hourly chart can you see the amount of detail that is on just three candles on the weekly chart this is the monthly chart and all of these little trend line drawings and the breakouts is what scalp tra swing traders or scalp traders are using to get in and out so in this case, they would have gotten out of the trade, out of the trade. Um, there, they would have probably, they didn't necessarily breach, so it continued on the uptrend. But then there's also these charts, so they would have bought there. They would have bought there, they would have bought there, they would have bought, and so onwards. So it gives you more entry exits because you're, you're getting in and out of investment, uh, out of trades than what you would do on a weekly chart. Okay, so can you see the time frames or the periods are vastly different according to what your your trading style is but the weekly would have said I've broken out of this particular trend I'm now entering a bull trend so as a 
as a, a swing trader or a scalp trader, I would have known that because it's got into bullish territory, there will be more buys for me than sells. So if there is a breakout like this, this is likely, I'm likely to get these type of moves because it is on the uptrend on a weekly chart. Can you see? So it's important to refer back to your longer term frame so you, you know how to trade on your shorter term frame. Okay, so you're not trading against the trend. And as you can tell, there are more of these green trend lines than there are the red trend lines because it is more bullish. Okay, so those are the time frames for different trading styles. Then we enter into the key patterns. It gets a bit deeper with this because this works more and there's certain patterns, I'll give you examples that, that will give you signals because, so now picture this, there is this trend and the trend has many stories to it. It develops many patterns and those patterns tell you what is the next move. I mean, does fundamentals do that? No, I'm just saying, what's the next move? You have to confuse the enemy, what's the next move? Patterns are the ones that tell you what's the next move. So when they form, and they break out, you know exactly, you have an idea of where it will go because it's broken out of a certain pattern. Okay, so the key patterns and how you would identify them, though I'm going to just mention a few guys because there is a plethora of patterns out there. I'm just gonna mention ones that are really key that you should keep, you know, keep your eye on and when you do see them. And a lot of the ones that are quite popular for bar charts and candlesticks are known as doji candles. All right. So doji candles usually occur after a nice bull run or a bear run. Okay, so they tell you when, okay, now this uptrend is exhausted or this downtrend is exhausted. Okay, so they, they it's usually kind of like a tug of war between buyers and sellers. And when, you know, when price, it's literally, it's where price opens and rates close, it's so, so close to each other so that is the tug of war so it's the we want to win no we're going to win no we're going to win so what the doji does is it tells you that okay the trend is getting exhausted there might be a change in trend but so it could be the trend line and then it's the doji that forms which is the tug of war and now you need to know the tug of war you need to know who's going to win this tug of war would it be the buyers or the sellers and that's what the dojis help you with now importantly you never trade on a doji candle. It's the next candle that will tell you who won. So if you see flat, and then you should know it's a tug of war. And if there is a preceding, a nice strong bullish candle that follows that doji, you must know it's the buyers that won. And if there's a bearish candle that follows that doji, it means the sellers have won. Sometimes you could have a few dojis which then means, shoo, this match is hectic. Like, they're fighting. I love it when I see dojis. I'm like, hmm, I wonder who's going to win. But you never trade on the doji. The next, and you don't even trade on the next candle. You trade on the third candle. Because the next candle is telling you who's, who's won. Then you start trading. Because you never know who's going to win. Some scalp traders get a bit naughty and they, they'll put positions on both ends. In case, they'll be like, whoever wins, I just want to get in. You know, so it's important not to trade on the doji, to wait for the following candle, and then trade on the third candle after the doji. Okay. So there are different types of dojis out there, and there is a standard doji. They've got their names. You don't have to know them. If you can just identify them, you would tell. So you see what I mean when I say the open and the close are pretty much the same. So this is a standard doji, and that's a long-legged doji. Standard would look like a cross, and the long-legged would be well, they both look like crosses, but um, okay, this is more in the middle and that would be more towards the, the, uh, the high. Then there is a fly, a dragonfly doji. I don't know who named these. It was actually the Chinese though, but this is how, how it looks. Literally ends like that. And then you've got the gravestone. This is like going six under like RIP. All right. So these are the simple dojis. If you see these type of can, these candles or bar charts form on your, 
on, on, on the chart or whatever instrument you're trading, you must know that there's a tug of war happening and there might be an exhaustion in that uptrend or exhaustion in the downtrend. Then there's an umbrella, Dorji, which, you know, there's, yeah, if you see these, these are just, you don't have to know them, but I'm just trying to show you how they look for you to then have an aha moment as in, okay, something's fishy here. Um, there's probably going to be a, tra a change in trend or so forth. So there's a standard doji, and then there's a, this one is not that common though, but it does happen where there is no wick completely, but there's just these, these little flat lines like that. Now, yeah, they, 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 they're seriously hustling here. This is a real bristle. And then it's the following candle that tells you buyers or sellers that have won. So if you identify these, you must know that you need to keep your, your guard up and you need to know what what's the next action because if you're if you've bought a share and the share price has been going up and then doji start forming you should then know that that trend is starting to get exhausted sometimes because there could be that 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 tug of war and then buyers still win and the trend goes up continues on its merry way or sometimes it could be a tug of war and then sellers win and then it's a change in trend and it also happens on the downside okay do you, is that clear? Okay, cool, cool. All right. Then there are reversal patterns. Every pattern means something in the market. And reversal patterns are ones that tell you, that mark the end of a particular trend. And they take some time to form. They could form on a weekly, daily, they form in any time frame. Uh, the most um, the ones I'm mentioning now are ones that have a really good success rate in terms of heading towards their targets when they are when the breakout has happened. And a bullish double bottom is usually something similar to this where um, you would have an, and a bearish. So this would this particular one would form in a bear trend. So when this forms, it marks the end. So it would be downside, downside, and then you have this, and then it starts new upside. This would form mostly in an uptrend where there is upside, upside, and then you start. That's so because you need signs of hmm, something's fishy, and the patterns help you with what's the something fishy. So in this case, if it breaches this this intermediate um, trough there, it means there's downside. But this is a particular level, and that's a particular level. So this could be at two at five rand. So you know, okay, if it breaches at five rand, I can start buying. Or if the share that I'm in and it trades below that 10 rand mark, it means I need to start getting out of that share 10 rand because it would have confirmed this pattern. Okay, so reversal patterns would be double bottom um, or a bearish double. Sorry, that was supposed to be double top. Oopsie, sorry, double top. Okay, and then how you measure, because that's another cool part, how you measure where the share will go from that breakout point is you then take it from where it's, this would be your support to where the resistance is. So if this is two Rand and that's five Rand, that means this will go up by three Rand. Okay, and the same here, it will fall down by whatever the width, so that's that's how much you expect it. So if, you, if it breaks out of a pattern, you've heard technical analysts say, oh, I expect it to go here if it breaks out of the pattern. It's because they've calculated from the pattern the highs and the lows and where from the breakout point it will go. The same applies with your, your double. So you would take from the top to the intermediate trough and you would then be able to predict how far it will fall once it's breached that level. And so some people actually just have, they don't calculate per se, they'll have that, I don't know if you've seen it in, in charting, where they'll just have a, a, a highlighted area um, from there to there and they would replicate that highlighted area and they will then see that that would be the top of where that's the target that you would have reached from that breakout point of that of the of the pattern. Okay. Then there are other reversal patterns would be I don't know if you've heard of inverted head and shoulders patterns. These take forever though, and you can never really identify one until the final shoulder is forming. So you have this long consolidation, and then towards it you're like, ah, oh, it's forming a head and shoulders pattern, now I get it, you know? And how you measure where it's gonna go, it's from the top of the head to the neckline, which is where it connects, literally the neckline here, projected upwards. And the same applies there, if you wanna know how far. So in other words, if you, let's say you've bought a share 
and it's forming this head and shoulders and you want to know, okay, if it confirms this head and shoulders, should I sell there? But if, for example, if this head and shoulders is, if you calculate that this will only be a 6% drop, you'd be like, it's fine, I'll stay in. I'll just stand that weather. Of course, if it's the 20% drop, you'll be like, yo, I need to get out of here when it breaches that. So the calculation of your head to that will tell you how far it will fall for you to make the decision on whether should you still stay or should you get out as soon as the pattern has been broken. That's why you need to know, you need to calculate how far um, or you know it will drop or rise. Okay, even when you buy there, you'll be like, okay, I buy there, I'm anticipating a nice 60% gain because it's a 16% from the head to the neckline projected upwards. Okay. Then continuation patterns are basically, they form because, you know, the minute you start seeing a, a trend line that's got bullish candles that are like that, you need to start becoming a bit suspicious. Trends form like this. They don't form like this. So in this, in the pullbacks, or rather, you know, whatever position you're taking, those pullbacks, you get continuation patterns, and they come in a form of a bullish flag or a falling wedge. I usually say it's it's kind of like how I would identify is imagine yourself jogging. You're jogging, you're jogging. You can't, I mean, if you jog forever, I'm, sh you know, good luck to you, but there's a point where you need to breathe, take a sip of water, and then potentially continue jogging, right? So, this is you jogging, taking a sip of water, you know, asking yourself, should I continue, should I go home? If you feel like you can continue, it's the breakout point and you continue with your jog. But if it breaches the lower end, it means you've decided to now go home. So the, bre the breaching of this continuation will tell you if the trend is continuing or the trend is now pulling back. But in most cases, when you see such formations, it means the trend is going to continue. If it does pull back, then it means you need to start getting out of the trade. If it breaches particularly the lower slopes. Now, how do you calculate where the share will go once the broke breakout has happened? Now, these are the ones I love particularly because you have to calculate it from the flag point. So it would be from the start of that to where, where the, the trend ended, projected from the breakout point upwards. It's not this. It's the start there projected upwards. And the same applies there. Where it started to there projected upwards. So with a flag, you'd have two parallel lines going down. With a falling wedge, it's when they converge like that. So when you start drawing your trend lines, which automatically happens, and you, oopsie, oh, what have I done? So if you draw your trend lines and you, you're seeing yourself draw a channel like that, you'll instantly know it's a flag. If you're seeing it, your trend line's converging, you'll know it's a falling, it's a wedge. Okay. Other continue, this is for a bearish, um, this would be a bearish flag, the opposite of the other one. And how you can see it would be from the flag point to, sorry, that was supposed to be to there, and then projected, oopsie, oops, sorry. So it's from there to there, there to there. I hope I did the right. Okay, no, yeah. There to there and projected point from there to there. That's how you calculate. So, for example, if that is at 10 Rand and that's at 2 Rand, you'll know it could fall 6 Rand from your breakout point, it will fall by 6 Rand. Okay. Consolidation patterns are the ones that also you never really know where they're going to break out, but Breakout from the top end means it's done a positive breakout upwards, but a breakout from the lower slope would mean it's a bearish breakout. And how you calculate where the share is going to go from there, you calculate the base of the symmetrical triangle projected upwards. So unlike a flag, which would be at the top there to there, this is the base. And then again here, it would be the base, so you could know how far it's going to fall. Okay, so those are the continuation patterns. And the continuation patterns, like I say, they're not, if you know there's a flag or a wedge that forms in a bull trend, you automatically kind of know that it's a continuation pattern, so the upside is going to continue. 
unless the lower um, lower lower slope is breached. Yes. So it's it's more sideways. It's not this way. I mean that's the only way I can. So when it forms, it's forming sideways, it's downwards or upwards. Yeah. Okay, so those are the popular ones, symmetrical triangle, and this is such a boring part. When symmetrical triangle forms, you're like, oh my God, this is gonna end. Because you need, but because it literally, it will be, the upside will be con you know, co um, curbed by this, and but yet it's not falling. But then there would be a point where it's like, okay, the buyers of one or the sellers of one. It's also kind of like a tug of war, like a doji, but more visual representation of the doji. Am I good at time? Yeah, okay, cool, cool. All right. Oh, I'm actually towards the end, kind of. Like, now we're putting everything together, everything that you've learned. So what I've shown you, I'm gonna now put it all together on one chart. Okay, should we start? So, Bashini group, <coughs> hints. Clear bar chart. What am I gonna, I'm going to need my map. I'm going to, which is now the trend line drawing. Okay. Now, started that uptrend. So you already knew that they might, if it continues with this uptrend, then you know that, ah, it might eventually, if it's if it keeps falling but bouncing on this, it means there will be a potent, uh, an eventual break out of this bull trend, bear trend rather. So that's what the map is saying. It's saying, okay, I've broken out, cool. I've also drawn a trend line there. So that trend line would have guided you to say, okay, something's happening. This, these bears are now, this pes pes pessimism is now turning into optimism. Okay. Okay, I'm just kind of showing you how I draw these trend lines because to me they're very important because in this trend line I would have known that, okay, this is where I get out um, and there's that, that downside. But anyway, this is a longer term trend line. Can you see these are shorter term trend lines? But the important one is the longer term trend line that's dated back further. So there, it's telling, marking the end of that downside and the start of upside. Now you need your compass to show you what level are you going to buy this, this, this share. So it's telling me there, can you see it's a support that's becoming resistance? So at that point, and if you see there, there was a lot of resistance met there too. So it means buying at 136.90 is the level I should be. This actually broke out this week. I did this presentation maybe like last week, and then it broke out. I was like, damn, it's really. And then obviously I need to go buy some shares. So it's recently broken out. And my take profit, because from because you need to know that. If it breaks out, where do I expect it to go? And your resistance levels guide you. Now, one thing you should know that a breakout from a bear trend, from a long-term bear trend, there will always kind of be a 100% retracement to its all-time high, a gradual one. Not all at once, a gradual one. So I already know that, okay, if I'm buying here, I'm gonna take profit at 211, okay? Which gives me a nice 35% return, okay? For as long as it's maintaining its uptrend, this is likely to go to 211, okay? I can buy again, where can I buy again? I can buy again when it hits that top, which is a resistance, can you see? So I can buy again at 172, and if I buy again, I'm kind of like doubling my profits at this point, okay? Now, my binoculars is like, where do I get out if this goes wrong, all right? That's where you use your support. And can you see, this was resistance that is now going to be support. So it means if I if I get this wrong, if this turns, I should get out at 19.10. Because the thing is, if it gets to 19.10, it would actually be resuming its bear trend, meaning this was a false break and reversal. So I need to get out at 119 if I want if I want to be safe, which is what roughly. So my stop loss would be at 119.10, and I want to buy and you know I, I've bought at 136.90. So for as long as it's trading above 136.90, I'm good. All right, the stop loss there is 15%. Am I happy with 15%? I'm like, yeah, it, it's still because to me what's important is I will because remember you're going to use the 2% rule now. You're only going to lose 100 rand. Okay, but at 19, at 15 is where you're going to be like, okay, this was a 
fast break and reverse. So let's look okay, it happens. Let me look for another share. So now remember you've got 5,000 and you want to use your 2% rule. So you're only going to risk 100 rand per, per, per trade. And in this case, we you're agreeing you could do a 10%, but I'm comfortable with 15. Okay, so this is where I'm buying. How many shares must I buy in order to only lose 2% of my capital at a 15% stop loss? Okay, so I'm buying it at there. Percentage stop would be at, if you, the percentage stop, if you had one, would be at 10, but your chart stop is 15 because that's where your support level is. I'm happy with my chart stop level. So 30, one, um, 136.90 times 10 would be 13.70. That's where your stop loss would be there. At, with a chart stop, this is where your stop loss would be. It, it would be 13 minus uh, um, 136. 20 minus 15%, it means my stop loss, I'll be stopped out. Okay, it's roughly, it was 119, but this one's 116. It's roughly around there, okay? But still, how many shares must I buy? Cool. So, um, if you go 100 divided by 1370, which is your 10% stop loss, it means you have to buy seven shares. Divide, it's 100 divided by that seven shares. If it's 15%, it means so the higher your stop loss, the less shares. Okay, so that means I have to buy five shares if I want a 15% stop loss. Okay, so 2% rule is you're only going to risk 100 Rand. Now let's work it out. Seven shares times 13, it's below 100. If it's 15%, four shares times what your stop loss is, it's still below 100. So you're still only risking 100 Rand of your trade at a 15% stop loss. So it sounds scary that it's 15%, but you're only going to lose 100 Rand. Okay. Capital cost, you buy seven shares. Um, if you, if you know, if you, this is how much you will, if it's 15, that's your capital cost. So you will, for 17, what have I calculated here? Uh, okay. So, all right, so seven shares times that 13, that 113.90 means you're going to spend 958 to buy those shares. But if you use a 15%, it means you're only going to spend 547 to buy four shares and only lose 15% of that at a 15% stop loss. You're still only losing 100 Rand. All right. So now we've got the why. Why are we entering the trade? Because of a trend line breakout. We've got a how. How are we entering the trade? Are we going long or are we going short of this trade? And then we've got the where. At what price are we going to be entering the trade and at what stop loss? Now we need to know the when. Because do I buy it today or do I wait? Do I buy it tomorrow? Or, or can I buy it today or do I? And that's when you have, in your preparation, you need to have a nice flask of coffee because you need to relax and wait for your level to be breached. You are never going to trade the share until your level is breached. And sometimes you could, you could wait for months until that level, and it's okay. Rather trade when that level is breached. Don't try and outsmart it because it will outsmart you. Okay. Now, when do I buy or sell? This is when we use what you know as oscillators. Okay. And the most popular oscillators that you should, that I really prefer and which I would like to do you, for you to do your homework on, and we will probably have another session with that, it would be your relative strength index or your stochastic index. Those are the best indicators to give you the win. Can I buy today or should I wait? Because it will tell you. If, it's, if, if there's going to be that pullback before you can buy or you can just buy because there's room for it to buy. And that's where you use your overbought and your oversold levels. I'm not going to be talking about them today, but it's a little homework for you to do. Okay. So now your complete preparation kit, preparation kit should have your map for your trend line drawing, your, your compass to identify support and resistance levels, your binoculars to identify your stop loss levels, and your cup of flask to sit and wait until your level is breached. Okay. 
from me and my little guy, my little pilot guy, i hope this was helpful.